going to talk about uh, surgical options and details of surgery for this uh, group of, for those of you who have kyphosis and uh, for this patient uh, group. So we've, all three speakers now, myself included, have spoken about this longer term study. And these studies are very difficult to perform. Uh, patients move out of town, they get married, they change their name, so it's very difficult. So when we have a long term study like this, everybody talks about it because it's, it's hard to get the data. And so uh, you've already heard that some patients with uh, Schoenerman's kyphosis may have more intense back pain, less strenuous jobs, and less uh, core body strength. And there can also be a, a decline in lung function for the most severe curves of 100 degrees or more. And we've uh, found that as well. I'll, t I'll touch on that in the second session. So uh, just uh, for housekeeping, we're going to uh, go through this session. I think there is a 10 minute break built into the between the two sessions, but I think we can make that a five minute break and then get right into it so we can really have meaningful discussions and that's what you're all here for and then break for lunch. So um, let's go on to the next slide. So quality of life. Uh, Matt mentioned that we've done some uh, studies on this. We did a prospective study, so followed uh, uh, over 100 patients, approximately 125 patients that were surgical patients and uh, with Schreierman's kyphosis. Uh, it was a six or seven year study and we've published a lot of papers on it. We've learned a lot. More important than publishing is what we learn and uh, what messages we're able to then give to you, the, the families and the patients. And what we learned is in the Scheuermann's kyphosis patients, we compared them to adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and to uh, adolescents who were, did not have any spinal condition. And you can see that uh, the Scheuermann's kyphosis patients had more pain, uh, more self-image concerns about the appearance of their back and other concerns. And it was to a greater extent than the scoliosis group. So this is a, a real condition and you're here to learn more about it and to convey your own experiences and I appreciate that. Uh, it comes in two flavors, so you saw from Steve the, uh, the diagnostic criteria, how you diagnose these patients, and they come in two different sh shapes and sizes. So uh, some will have a mid-thoracic apex, so the, the apex where the back sticks out is higher, and, uh, and the, did I do that, did that go by itself? Uh, it, may, it must be on time mode. Um, and then there's a thoracic lumbar, so a lower apex, lower in the back, and those tend to be more painful. And uh, I have done some work in Africa, and of course my practice in Manhattan, and what we find is uh, patients are very similar in their experiences, and regardless of nationality and color or creed, they really have similar experiences. Some may be heavier than others, but, but basically they feel the same, and they have the same kind of concerns as do their families. And so, uh, management, you've heard, we can do exercise and physical therapy, bracing for curves, curvatures or kyphosis up to 70 degrees in some cases. Uh, and then we consider surgery for curves of greater than 70 degrees in a growing adolescent with the curve getting worse or progressive, but also for smaller curves, for a thoric lumbar, so a lower apex where that uh, spine is jutting out and can be very painful and uh, those individuals may have surgery for much smaller curves. We actually had a patient uh, in the prospective study that had a 35 degree kyphosis, but it's because of where the apex was. And we've done some research showing how we can change the apex with surgery, so and I'll show you pictures of that. Uh, and those, of course, who have been uh, do doing a non-operative uh, program, following through with that and have not uh, experienced pain relief. and. Um, Certainly appearance is important to patients. So we have a number of options for treatment. The most common is surgery done from the back. That's the posterior approach. I would say close to 90% of procedures. Then there may be a role for anterior front or through the side posterior from the back. So and I, uh, typically that's a VATS video assisted thoracoscopic surgery. So small incisions through the side and take discs out make the spine more flexible, and I'll show you a picture. Is everybody okay if I show a few intraoperative photos? They're not too, uh, I think, too gross, if you will. I think hopefully it's okay for everybody. 
and um, posterior then, so we loosen up the spine and then we go from the back. And in cases where we now routinely, routinely perform an MRI of the spine before surgery, so we'll routinely do that and we're looking for disc herniations or abnormalities of the spinal cord. But if a disc is herniated or slipped backwards and it's pressing or near the spinal cord, we want to remove that before surgery because there's a risk of pushing that disc into the spinal cord with surgery, which increases the risk of being paralyzed or having a neurological deficit. So we'll take the disc out in those cases and we'll do that through this uh, minimally invasive approach. And then there's pedicle subtraction osteotomy. It's not important the name, but it's really a more advanced cutting into the spine. It's a little more risky and we'll use that for very rare cases where there's a very stiff and angular curve. I'll show a case of that. And then even more rare is just a going through the side with an anterior approach only. I have a case that I'll show you. The, the advantage may be that there's less blood loss if we fuse less levels of the spine and we don't impact the muscles of the back. So here's the workhorse. I'm glad you're all okay with the pictures. So we uh, do these uh, simple osteotomies or cutting into the bone so we create spaces. We put our screws in and then we place the rod and then we cantilever it down and we bring it to the spine and then correct. We squeeze the, seg the segments together one by one by one to get to dial in the correction we want. And we also shape the rod. So we contour the rod so that it matches the, the normal contour uh, in the side plane or the sagittal plane for the patient. And we can adjust where we make the apex and we can move that apex to a more normal position. And I'll show you pictures of that. Here's a 17-year-old young man that we operated on. And you can see his neck is very I think, uh, Steve, you should, or no, Matt, you might have shown the picture where the patient who has this kyphosis then develops more of a sway in the lower back and in the neck. So, and that can be very painful, particularly in the adult uh, who's lived with this, right, Jody, their whole life. And, uh, and they may be jutted forward a little bit, protruding forward, and then you're compensating all day long by hyperextending, and that hurts. You load the joints of your spine, and when it we correct, like it hurts like the dickens. So, and then the, when we correct this, and we've shown this, I'm not going to show pictures of it, but the cervical lordosis and the lumbar lordosis or sway actually decreases. So the patients are more relaxed and more comfortable in their standing. So, uh, really, the surgery corrects the kyphosis, but also corrects the other areas as well. Here's a young lady, 16 years old, with a big curve. And in, in those years, that was probably 10, 15 years ago, we would do what a, we routinely do these small incisions, and we'd uh, the back is from here, so we would do this all in, with the patient in one position. We'd take the discs out at multiple levels. You can see the disc is removed. That made that spine more flexible and allows us to get a correction, as you see here. And so she did very well with that surgery. Here's a young man that we did the vats uh, for this disc herniation. He had no neurological problems, he had no pain, he had some pain, but it wasn't pain pressing on the spinal cord or nerves. But we picked this up on a routine MRI and we took the disc out and he went through surgery very safely and without any problems. Here's a, the pedicle subtraction osteotomy. I'll show you an illustration of that. But basically, this is a very severe and angular curve and we do, what we do is we take a wedge of bone out and what it allowed us to do, if we followed the usual rules, we would have fused to L4, but we were trying to save a level uh, for this young man and we cut the wedge of the bone out. We migrated the apex higher, which is all, what all these lines are showing, um, and corrected him. That was about 10 years ago and uh, he did very well with that surgery. So that's the wedge resection. We take the wedge of bone out and then we realign and reconnect. And it allowed us to really move things and change the overall alignment of the spine. And here's that case that I mentioned going through the side. Uh, I think this is the only patient I have now, but I think it, this potentially has merit for some of our patients where we take this long kyphosis and instead of fusing the whole thing as we do typically, we also address scoliosis, which commonly occurs in conjunction with the kyphosis. It's not uncommon to see small curves, but also we can maybe do a shorter fusion just to address this. 
very different than what we would do from the back where we have to do a longer fusion because the spine doesn't compensate as well. The muscles are cut and they're not intact. So uh, there may be a role for this in the future. It's certainly not standard. Uh, and I'm, you know, we do it through these smaller incisions through the side. So hopefully I didn't gross anybody out with that. But those are our, our dear patients and they tolerate the surgeries well. And you know, we just looked at how we were able to change uh, the, the deviation, so the apex, when you have kyphosis, as you all know, your back sticks out a little bit. After surgery, the apex is, is brought in. And, and then the lumbar spine, where the apex is deviated, the sway is a, a great deal that comes back as well. So we just depicted that. And we make the apex the most protruding part of the back. We normalize it. We put it into a more normal location. So if it was very low, uh, caudal to T8 means it's very low in the spine. It should be higher up. And after surgery, we m made it more normal for the majority of patients. And that just sort of schematically shows that as well. Just briefly on complications, and then uh, we'll go into the next talk. I'm right on schedule. Um, the uh, complications. So we've compared complications in, in Scharman's kyphosis. This was in uh, 97 patients at that time. We, we enrolled over 100 patients. but uh, And we compared it to 800 patients in the our database, the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation, which had houses the HARM study group, which is our research group. We have a registry of scoliosis patients, and so we have a lot of patients. We have several thousands of patients in that registry, and so we can do studies to look at how patients are doing and look at their outcomes. And we found that complication rates in Schreierman's kyphosis are higher, 16% versus 2%. And there were more infections in, in, this, uh, in, in our series, 10% versus very less than 1% and more reoperations, uh, more instrumentation problems, and more neurological problems. So we could look at that a little more deeply and uh, get to some of this in the uh, questions and answers. The most common reasons for reoperation were surgical site infection in the Schreierman's kyphosis, as well as for the scoliosis group. Uh, there was one patient uh, with a neurological issue, but it really wasn't a true deficit. There was spinal cord monitoring changes during surgery in one of the sites, well, so this was a multi-center study, and uh, the surgery was aborted and then the surgeon went back and uh, the patient had a very a successful correction with no problem whatsoever. There were three out of the 97 patients in this study had to have their instrumentation replaced because the screw loosened or pulled back, so, and that was fixed compared to uh, four in the scoliosis group. Uh, and I told you about the neurologic, there was no serious neurological complications in uh, the nearly 100 patients. So take-home points, uh, we operate or at least recommend surgery for severe curves or very painful curves that may be less severe in terms of their magnitude, in terms of the size of the curve, but if it's located lower in the back, it kind of is in a position where the pain is greater and it, and it might not look so good. So uh, it may bother the patient from a self-image standpoint. And uh, there are different approaches. Of course, the posterior from the back is most common. And there are complications, but they tend to be low. And I think we're getting better and better at providing the safest uh, surgery. So again, looking at our results and learning from them makes us better surgeons and, and surgeons around the world better through studying these outcomes. So thank you for your attention, and I will now go to uh, the next talk will be Holly Lucen, who is going to discuss what to expect, surgery and recovery, in Schreierman's kyphosis. So Holly, let me get you on, on track here. Let me give you this. Can you guys hear me if I speak like this? Yeah, or do you, you want have slides? Yeah. yeah. There you are. And again, I'm Holly. I'm a physical therapist that actually works here at Johns Hopkins. And I'm going to be talking just about physical therapy post-operatively, so immediately post-operatively. Um, this is more of a practical presentation about what to expect. Um, and if you have any questions, again, we can answer those a little bit later. A couple things that I want you to think about the whole way through with any surgery, but especially with a uh, spinal fusion. Early mobility, early and often, that's kind of the theme here, that the earlier we get going, the faster that we're going to be 
aiming ourselves for recovery. The other part of recovering after surgery and before surgery is looking at your posture, trying to maintain good body mechanics and looking at your alignment. So these are kind of the themes that you're gonna see as I'm talking about this. Before surgery though, that is where the recovery starts in the preparation. So if you know you're heading for surgery, what are some things that you could be doing at home? Hopefully, some of you might have gone already through physical therapy or been through conservative management, so you'll know some of these things. Practicing good body mechanics and spine mechanics. This is for everybody. It's not just for someone who has a spinal deformity. It's everybody should be following these. But using your large muscles of your legs to lift. If you're going to pick up something light, the golfer's lift. Lifting your leg to keep your back in alignment. Avoiding twisting and bending. And um, again, maintaining your good posture when you're sitting or standing always. One of the things after surgery that everyone's like, oh, well, how am I doing this? Log rolling. I know this sounds really ridiculous, but getting in and out of bed. If you practice this before you come in for surgery, you're one step ahead of the game. Learning how to roll all together and sit up from your side and actually get into bed the same way, sitting down and laying down. You're one step ahead of the game if you're practicing some of these things. And I know that was talked about in the main discussion thing, exercise, maintaining good health, but walking and keeping yourself healthy before surgery is gonna ensure a better recovery. Some more practical points. M talked about this too, pillows. Pillows after surgery so that when you're sitting up you have things to support you. A body pillow is very helpful in bed for positioning yourself on your side. Sounds like she used it for sitting as well. You also want to look at before you come in for surgery what kind of seating options do you have at home. So you're going to have to be sitting up. We want you out of bed. So where are you going to be sitting? Look at that and how are, how are you going to arrange that so it's going to be more, most comfortable for you. Are there obstacles at home for you walking around and moving? If there's throw rugs down, maybe you want to take them up for a little bit. If you have a loft bed, well, it's going to be a little hard getting in and out of bed if it's a high bed, so just thinking about these things before you come in. And also looking at where you potentially can be exercising and walking right after surgery. So we know walking is going to be very important. Where are you going to do this? Is there enough room for you to be walking adequate time around your house? Is there room outside? Or are you going to have to go to maybe a school that has a track? a shopping mall that has places that you can walk inside where it's air conditioned and comfortable. And then a very practical point, if you have long hair before surgery, braid or pull your hair back. It's gonna save you a lot of time and effort. Again, this is a very practical point, but the, the, especially girls that have extremely long hair, if it's braided, it's gonna just make life a lot easier right after surgery. So physical therapy is typically gonna see you either the same day or the day after your surgery. And the goals for that first visit are gonna be get you up out of bed, get you sitting in a chair, and hopefully get you walking. And at this point too is when we're gonna review hopefully what you already know about having good spine, body mechanics, and deep breathing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but breathing is very important. It helps with muscle relaxation, it helps with getting good oxygen, and it's gonna help with your recovery, but these are just the basic things we're gonna do. And your overall goals with therapy in the hospital and for recovery for going home, so we want you to be able to move in and out of bed very easily. We want you walking. We want you being able to do a flight of stairs and know about your home exercise program, which is very simple. We're not going to be able to do aggressive stretching and strengthening exercises after surgery. It really is going to be walking, swimming sometimes after your surgical site is healed. And pain medicine. So pain medicine is going to be your friend after surgery. It's going to help keep you comfortable, but it also comes with some side effects. And the side effects of that are dizziness, upset stomach, constipation, irritability. This one sometimes surprises people, but actually the pain medicine can change, temporarily change your personality. We know it's not you, um, and that will get better once you get weaned down from some of the medicine. And drowsiness, you're gonna tend to be much sleepier in the hospital. It's also because you just had a major surgery. You might've had some blood loss, but the pain medicines themselves are gonna make you feel sleepy and a little bit lethargic. They're also gonna suppress your breathing. So while we want those to help keep you comfortable, one of the reasons they're trying to wean you is so that you take your normal deep breaths. You're gonna be more at risk to need oxygen maybe while you're sleeping. Not a big deal, you're usually gonna wean off of that pretty quickly if you need it at all. And then I can't stress again the importance of early mobility. The mobility is gonna help with your healing, but it's also gonna help counteract some of those effects of those pain medicines. So it's gonna relax and the muscles and reduce some of your pain. It's gonna facilitate the deep breathing that we need. It's also gonna really help with bowel motility. So to avoid some of this constipation, the sooner we get walking, that's more of a normal body function and you're gonna be able to perform better that way. It's also gonna help with appetite. So a lot of you aren't gonna have appetites right after surgery. We need you to eat because that's gonna build your energy and strength. So moving around, getting up is also gonna improve that. 
and it's going to improve your general sense of well-being. Nobody feels as good as they do when they're up walking, standing, and doing normal activities. When you're in bed, you're in a bed role. You're sleepy, you're lethargic, or you're in that sick role. And we don't want you to be in that sick role. We want you to get back to doing all the things that you love. That's why you're having surgery to begin with. So in the hospital, right away, when you get wake up from surgery, some things that you can be doing are moving your ankles up and down, just simply pumping your feet up and down. It's gonna help with the blood flow. It's gonna help get you loosened up a little bit. It's also gonna be an exercise that when you first sit up out of bed, it's gonna be helpful to help reduce some of your dizziness by getting the circulation pumping back up to your, your head. Um, also encouraging you to do the active movements. So right away, trying to do what you can to roll in bed and reposition. I heard Em say that she needed a lot of help with this. We really encourage you to start doing the rolling and repositioning as soon as possible on your own. We will help you, but I anticipate that you'll be able to do this before you leave the hospital. And also using your arms. You have surgery on your back, it doesn't affect your arms. Parents are quick to come in with a drink, they're quick to hold up someone's phone. Um, but if you want to use your phone, you can text, you can use those arms. That's going to help relax those muscles by encouraging you to use them again. And practicing deep breathing with that device there, it's called an incentospirometer. The nurse will probably give you that right away after surgery. Doing a couple deep breaths with this just helps improve your lung function. And the one big rule here too is we like to use the change your position or move around at least every two hours. Normally, if you haven't had surgery, even right now as you're sitting here, you're shifting around, readjusting your position, that's gonna help. With spinal surgery, you're gonna tend to get stiff if you're in one position for too long. So you may feel great at first when you get up into in the bed or you're laying down, but if you stay like that, you start to move, go, oh, so, so painful. But if you move a little bit quicker and earlier, it's gonna reduce that. And even if once you get home and you're feeling better, you're sitting up even watching TV or doing something, Every couple hours you should stand up, shift your weight around, and then sit back down to kind of help relieve some of that. So in the hospital, once physical therapy sees you, we're gonna to try to get you up at least three to four times a day to go for walks. And that's, again, depending on how you do on your initial assessment. Sometimes there's some variation with this. It doesn't have to be super long walks, but those walks are gonna be beneficial. We're gonna want you up in the chair at least a couple times a day. Usually we recommend getting up for meals at least but to sit up for a couple hours, because again, your body functions best in upright. That's why we sit up and move throughout the day. And it's okay though, if you're tired and you need to rest, to know that it's okay to go back into bed. You can take naps, you can rest at home. This is gonna be normal. You're gonna be a little bit more tired. You're gonna be um, than your normal self um, immediately after surgery and at least for a couple weeks after. And just again, remembering that two hour rule. Another important thing to remember, your muscles are gonna take time to relax and adjust to the new post-surgical alignment. So we're talking so much about how we're adjusting the spine, but your muscles have to respond to that. So a lot of times, and, and for this population, it's a little bit different than say your scoliosis, but some of you might have some scoliosis curve with that too. Those muscles wanna be in the same position they've been in forever. So think of it as a rubber band. You have the rubber band uh, stretched, and you're moving that rubber band into a new position, it wants to kind of go back to the, the way that it was, and that's how your muscles are. So moving around, getting up, is gonna help relax them so they're not gonna be as stiff. And you might notice, your family might tell you you're still curving one way, your shoulders up, you seem like you're still hunched, even though you've been corrected, that's normal. Your muscles are going to readjust. Um, it might take a few days, and, and once the muscles catch up with the spinal alignment, you're gonna be in um, better shape. And mobility, again, is gonna help this. Um, activities for daily living. So pillow height matters. We've corrected the kyphosis, so we do wanna try to limit, or correct it to some degree, we wanna limit the amount of pillows you've had under your head. So if people who have a little bit more severe kyphosis might be sleeping at home with multiple pillows. If you've been straightened out a little bit, we wanna try to eliminate some of those so that we can get your back back to being in the best alignment. You also wanna keep your back straight for dressing and like for putting on shoes or putting on socks. So you see this person here, just sitting at the edge and crossing their leg up versus doing the bend over to put shoes and socks on. And I will again tell everybody, these are good body mechanics for everybody. Everybody should not be bending over um, to do that. They can squat with their legs or use this technique. And if you have, especially for tall people, uh, remember to use your legs. So if you need to sit down low, if you're going onto a toilet, instead of bending over, again, you're using your legs to get down. Your legs are gonna be in good shape after the surgery. You just need to remember to use them.
And final check out with check off with PT. These are things that are going to happen again within a couple days of being in the hospital. Should be walking around the floor with just a little bit of assist from your family, if any. Getting in and out of a flat bed with no rails, um, with family helping you as well. Being able to get up and down a flight of stairs and making sure that you're independent with the walking program that we talked about before. And that would be 20 minutes of cumulative walking is what we usually suggest immediately once people are going home. So what that means is if you're tolerating a five minute walk, at, when you get home we want you doing at least four walks a day. If you're tolerating a 10 minute walk, at least two walks a day. And you can do more walking if you feel up to it, but that's kind of our general guideline. And you're always trying to progress to where you can do at least 20 minutes of continuous walking over time. So over the next couple weeks you're working towards that goal without excessive fatigue or pain. So if you are having either any of those symptoms, again, to scale back a little bit. There's no rush towards this timeline. It's what is comfortable for your body, but this is kind of what we're kind of working towards. And practicing your good body mechanics and posture because again, you need to get used to your body's new alignment and how it's gonna function. Slowly returning to your normal day-to-day -day activities and listening to your doctor about their timetable for returning to more strenuous activities or sports. It's gonna take eight to 12 weeks at least for your spine to start really fusing and then also starting to heal. So that's why this is a time period we really don't want you doing a lot of strenuous things. And again, check with the individual physician about their time timeline for you returning to these activities. If there are problems, if there's pain, if you're having difficulties with activities, outpatient PT is an option, but usually at least after this two to three month period of recovery, and that would be more like what they were doing with conservative uh, management, working on back extensor strength and probably a little bit of flexi flexibility in your muscles on the front of your trunk. And finally, just again, remember when you go home, we want you following our activity guidelines. The more active you are, the better you're gonna feel. You may be more tired than usual, just in general, and that is normal. So don't think there's something <coughs> wrong if you're not feeling up to yourself or you need to sleep more or you don't have the energy, that's perfectly normal. We want you eating well. Eating well is gonna give you energy for activities. It's also gonna just be helpful for maintaining general health. Supervision when you're going up and down stairs. No matter how good you're doing, if you're still on the heavy narcotics, we really recommend you have somebody just walking up the stairs with you. If you get dizzy or lightheaded, that family member is in a better position to maybe help you just to steady if that happens. Um, so it's a safety guideline. And everybody is unique, so recovery times may vary. Excellent, Holly, thanks. Why don't you have a seat over there? Yes, that was great and thorough. And I think you said you may be more tired than usual, but also I hear a lot of patients tell me they can't they can't sleep at night. It's oh, very common. Yeah. But maybe you'll speak to that. Yeah. Well, um, well, that's true too. So you were going to feel tired because your back is uncomfortable um, after surgery that you might not get as good of quality of sleep. You're also on narcotics, so the sleep pattern is a little bit different. As they wean that, that'll get better. But the the pain is going to improve every day, and as that pain improves, then the sleep should improve as well. So let's see if we have time for one or two questions, and I think we'll we'll finish once we're finished with this session. We can take a everybody can stretch their legs, stand up, stretch your legs for a couple of minutes, and if everybody two hour window. Yes. If everybody's okay, then we'll start the next session a few minutes early. Is that okay? Okay. That way we'll get more bang for the buck. All right. Um, I do have a question actually for you. Um, in terms of Going back to strenuous activity, um, I'm actually, we only have one working vehicle and I'm the mechanic that fixes said vehicle and it breaks a little more often. What's the usual time span between recovery of surgery, following all of these guidelines, to going from surgery to being able to crawl back under my vehicle? <laughs> yeah, so it's, that's a very tricky question to answer because a lot of that is going to it also is going to evolve how well you're healing and so when you go back for your follow-up with your physician too they kind of can assess that it, it varies so much that I hesitate to tell you an answer it, and it depends on the activity so getting down and, and growing under a car may be more strenuous than just yes. general walking I know some of the things from some of our surgeons here at Hopkins <laughs> and they may be different than others but I, I'd say a solid year before you're getting back to your real normal normal activities, but that can vary. That can yeah. be either a, a earlier time frame or it could be a little bit later. 
and your specific thing might be your other than that too. Any other comments? Doug, young man. I would ask like, so for athletics, mm -hmm. like not like football, but like baseball and things that aren't contact sports, but you still have to like twist a lot. Is it possible to play at full, full mobility or close to full mobility after a certain time period? Um, and I would say yes. Now certain sports, say yeah. gymnastics, may be difficult if you've had a fusion to do some of the maneuvers. Um, but this is, those are great questions, and that's also something if you're considering surgery that you should also have these discussions with the surgeon prior to going in so they can give you, if things change, like they can give you an estimate, but absolutely we have people that return to sports like baseball and high school athletics. Um, they usually take a little bit of time off, but they can get back to those. Uh, I would comment on that. We, we did a study on uh, scoliosis patients who underwent fusion, so it's very similar and some longer fusions than others. And the majority of patients, and this was in athletic adolescent patients who underwent surgery, specifically those who were very much involved in sports. And they could be dancers or gymnasts or um, do recreational activities or you know, full sports. So we found that most returned to their activities, a few didn't, um, but in the contact sport, uh, category, there was a loss of that in the majority of patients, so they tended not to go back to contact. And we're now just, we haven't published it yet, we're just now going back and looking specifically at gymnastics, dancing, and cheerleading, um, because those are, require more flexibility typically, so we're going to look at that. I, I suspect that some of those also didn't go back to their sport, and it also depends on how long the fusion is as well, how long it extends into the lumbar spine. Thank you. Yes. Uh, for someone who is possibly looking at surgery and possibly looking to start family, well, female specifically, like right. my husband and I are in the family planning stage. So, what are complications if you have the surgery and then get pregnant down the line? Sure. Uh, so, a lot of <coughs> pregnant uh, women have, uh, you know, uh, pain, back pain, and with or without kyphosis or with or without with or without surgical uh, treatment for their condition. So. Still, potentially, will have back pain. Um, and to some extent, that is just part of uh, the, the course of uh, pregnancy and, and, and the process. And the fact that you have more weight in the front, it puts more stress on your back. So, I, I always counsel patients, it would be interesting to hear your perspective to just stay in shape before pregnancy. And, and throughout, you know, there'll be certain exercises you can do. So, keep your core strong and uh, low impact aerobics that tends to keep your back strong. In terms of uh, C-section or, or not, <clears throat> doesn't really need to be uh, impacted at all by the fact that you have a, a spinal fusion, um, and nor just kyphosis that hasn't been treated yet, as well as the ability to have an epidural. Um, if your fusion, if your whole entire back is not fused, usually there's room for an epidural to be placed. And so, for my patients who have had surgery, I say take a picture of your x-ray, and then when you meet with the obstetrician and the anesthesiologist, you can show them where the instrumentation ends, and they usually can get an epidural link below. Any comments about maintaining uh, back I mean, health I would just during second pregnancy? What you're saying is to stay healthy with that. I, I actually, I mean, because I am in pediatrics now, I, I dealt with adults many years ago, but um, I don't know as much about your specific situation, but correcting the alignment, I just feel like you would actually be in a better position because when you get pregnant, if you have this increased lordosis that is a result from the kyphosis, um, that actually predisposes you to even more back pain, like he was saying, that's normally part of the ligaments loosening when you get pregnant, so. Okay, so we finished a minute early. Let's take a couple of minutes uh, to stretch, talk, say hello and then we'll get started uh, just before five after, okay? Bathroom break time as well. <laughs>